August 2nd, 1991, that's when I go see Slacker on my 21st birthday. I'd never imagined before seeing that movie myself as a storyteller, let alone a filmmaker. But he held a mirror up to a world that I knew, even though it was a world away. Richard Linklater made it seem possible. Yeah, my friends, I would be lying if I said that Kevin Smith wasn't one of my biggest influences while growing up. One of my favorite films of all time has Alanis Morissette as God, Alan Rickman as her messenger, and George Carlin as a priest. That is such a winning combination, and I haven't even begun to scratch the surface with that film. Of course, with such a great director, with such a great repertoire of fantastic cinematography, there also comes some stinkers within the bunch, such as Clerks 2. I don't care for that movie at all, and because of the sequel, I am not going to be watching the third one. It's that bad. But either way, I do appreciate the times that Kevin Smith has thoroughly entertained me. Especially during his segment where he paired himself with Jason Mewes to perform Jay and Silent Bob. For such a long time, I did not know that Silent Bob was the director of the film and that he was just playing a stand-in character for the memes. And it made every single time he did speak quite monumental, actually. Just fucking say it already! The sign on the back of the car said Critters of Hollywood! You dumb fuck! Oh my god, man, that shit deserves an Oscar. Did it win an Oscar? Well, there you go. That's a victory in my books. But I was curious as to where Kevin Smith got this really campy, raw, and edgy aesthetic to all of his films. The storytelling always reminded me of like late night Nickelodeon stuff, but just a lot more edgy. And of course, the answer to that question, as we learned earlier, was from the film Slacker. And that's what this video is pretty much going to be about, this movie. Is this movie as good as Kevin Smith makes it out to be? I was surprised to learn while researching this video that Richard Linklater directed School of Rock, which is such a good movie in my opinion that just, wow, how can this be bad? But I don't want to get your hopes up. Remember what I said, some directors can make some shitty films every once in a while. My hesitancy with Slacker stems from the fact that this is a very experimental film. As in, this is not really a movie with a plot. Rather, the best way to classify Slacker would be to consider it to be an experience. Something that you go through. I consider this movie to be an avant-garde film, but my friend considered it mumblecore. And I'm not necessarily familiar with that phrase, so let me try my best to summarize it for you. Mumblecore can be best described as naturalistic dialogue in a film. A lot of it is very improvised and sometimes unpredictable. One example that I can think of is from Fritz the Cat where these crows are having a conversation amongst themselves. I want if I get to, I quit. <laughs> but you don't good want to day. say it. I don't want to say it, man. <laughs> no, I'm good. You say it good as you want it, but you don't want to say it. When I get tired, I quit. I went to school in Oakland. And I had quite a few white that were school kids with me. I'm 49. At that time, I had white kids going to school with me. Notice how the characters in this scene are just kind of talking to each other, almost as if this is a conversation that is specifically meant for each other. Most actors, especially voice actors, would project whatever they are saying to the microphone as if they are trying to rather tell the audience instead of just each other. Because even if these people are fully informed that they are part of a movie, the purpose of this scene is to give the characters a more conversational tone as if they've known each other for a while. Family, friends, comrades, or even just an acquaintance at a bar. 
With this description as to what Mumblecore is, I can say for certain that that is what Slacker is, especially having watched it myself a few times. Unlike Fritz the Cat, where those mumble segments only occur every so often, Slacker does the Mumblecore element from start to finish. It is the entire movie. And that's why I say it is an experience rather than a plot, meaning you have to kind of come into this film with completely different expectations. I think sometimes for certain audiences, that could be a little too much for someone to ask for. In a way, it could be considered homework or an exercise that someone has to practice before and during the film. But for the sake of the video, we are having this conversation, and so therefore, we should be looking at this film through those lenses. And that's pretty much what I'm going to be doing here, folks. We are asking the questions. How well did Slacker age, and is it really any good? Even though Slacker doesn't really have a plot, I should at least explain the concept, because it does play based on a concept here. Slacker is a bunch of random scenes that are somewhat interconnected to each other in a social aspect. And each scene is a small snippet throughout the course of a 24-hour period. To kind of give everything away to you from the very get-go, that man in the gray shirt is the director Richard Linklater. He starts the film in the back of a fucking cab, completely explaining the entire premise of the film, but it's played off as if he has some harebrained concept in his head that he's just sharing to some random stranger. But that's exactly what he's doing. He's explaining the premise of the film as hidden away into an introductory segment. Richard may as well be playing himself in this scene, where we're supposed to be the taxi driver. Richard makes it to his destination, and Richard begins to walk as a pedestrian to another location, which a major scene breaks out. At first, it looks like a hit-and-run situation, but if you look closely, you can see the blood on the back of this lady's head. And the camera is slowly panning out until we finally see that the person who murdered this woman is her son. What I like about this scene is the narrative cues and symbolism that is used in the shots, like this spray-painted hand, almost ordering this murderer to go to his room. And he just nonchalantly calls the police, opens up a shrine and lights it up, and just turns himself in. But you gotta keep in mind that time is passing as all of this is happening. This is because every scene was shot at specific times of the day, and it goes in chronological order throughout the film. Going back to the very beginning of the film just very briefly, we notice that the film is very dark, almost like the sun is just about to rise, but this looks more like 7am. Everybody's having a little bit of breakfast and coffee in their study groups, waking up, warming up. And because it was shot in the morning, the day still feels very young, therefore the people who are interacting throughout the film are also very much waking up still. But it's so baffling in light of this murder, we're being presented with this mundane slice of life content. But it is also kind of a grim reality that sometimes murders happen when we're not even looking, when we're not even aware of it and that sometimes horrific and traumatic experiences happen within the mundane life that we live. Playing into the fact that it's still the morning, this guy in the Batman t-shirt is talking to this random teenager, probably a college student, about conspiracy theories. You know about the uh, suppressed transmission, of course. Mm -mm. No? Ah, well. This is the uh, 20th anniversary of the moonwalk, you know, and way back there when they <laughs> given us that one giant step for mankind bit, Oh, yeah. Another astronaut's in the background yelling his fool head off, saying, Oh, my God, what's that over in the crater? What the hell is that? Well, NASA cuts him off just like that. But those of us with the right kind of radios, you know what I mean? Yeah, we got enough of it. The gist of it, what there's a giant spacecraft over in the other crater. Looking at them. That's right. Oh, it all begins to leak out then that the space program is just one giant big cover-up. You can tell that this college student is not up for a whole ass lecture about whether or not the space landing was fake or whether or not there were extraterrestrial life spotted on the moon. He didn't sign up for that and it's still really early in the morning. I'm an anarchist and a communist and somebody who would normally be up for political discussions like this, but this is so early in the morning that even I would just be like, hey, can you fuck off buddy? I haven't had my coffee yet. Uh, QAnon? Okay, we're done with this conversation, buddy. 
Anyway, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to keep reminding you that this takes place in the course of a day, so for the rest of this review, just please keep that in mind, because as you can see throughout fast forwarding this film, it is getting continuously darker and darker. I'm not going to repeat myself over and over, just remember that this literally takes place in the course of a day, thank you. I have noticed that there are a lot of preachy people within this film. All of them have very radically different ideas. However, most of them do just fall along the lines of conspiracy theory. Like this guy who has a very Jordan Peterson-esque perception of the homeless and women. Followed by the same girl running into another guy in the bookstore who has a bunch of conspiracy theories about the Kennedy killing. Even with these rather problematic subject matters aside, I can't help but to feel very awkward and very uncomfortable during these scenes, even as an audience member. If I had to describe the bookstore scene with one word, it would be suffocating. Because in both of these scenes, I feel like I am the girl here who is trying to just get out of both of these conversations. There is an exception, however, although I am biased, I have a greater reason as to why this is the exception, and that is with this old man. Let's back up a moment. This guy is trying to rob this apartment, where the old man who resides in this apartment reveals himself, and the old man is like, literally unfazed that this guy just broke into his home and has a gun and pointed it at him. Now, real quick and pause, how do you think this old man is going to respond if you haven't already seen the movie? Go ahead and type it below and tell me if you were right. If you're here to steal something, you've come to the wrong place. Nothing much here. But look around, take whatever you want. Yeah, put yourself in the shoes of the robber here. Like, wait, you're not gonna call the police? Well, well shit, I mean, yeah, you could just take my gun away. I mean, I'll, I'll just help myself. Later on, it is then revealed that this older gentleman is an anarchist. So, what do you call yourself? Paul. Yuzimski. That Polish? Uh-huh. He was Polish. Who's that? One of the true heroes of American history. Leon Chalgush, the man who assassinated William McKinley. He was an unknown Polish emigre who happened to be an anarchist of the propaganda by the deed variety. Yeah, I'm just gonna nerd out about this and just show you a compilation of some of my favorite lines from this man. There was such a thing as belief put into action in those days. What are you doing this afternoon? Let's go for a walk. I was there in Catalonia. Fought with Orwell. Didn't know it then, of course. Still have my CNT card. I'll show it to you later. Communists killed it long before Franco got there. Just look at that shit. I've always dreamed of pulling a Guy Fox on the Texas legislature. Just blow the damn thing sky high. I've got maps in my room and I'll do it someday. Texas, so full of these so-called modern-day libertarians with all their goddamn selfish individualism. Just the opposite of real anarchism. They don't give a damn about improving the world. I like to think that even though he was old as shit by the year of 1991, which is the year I was born, by the way, that he is still fighting the good fight. It's almost endearing to just watch him talk about this. And more importantly, he didn't force his other dude to get involved in this conversation like everyone else did. He invited him, even though he was the one being robbed. Even for a man as old as him from his generation, he understood very clear that consent and autonomy is so crucial to every social interaction. And I do want to say that buried within this film, this gentleman right here is a fine example of actual, legitimate, positive anarchist representation in cinema. Which, if you know anything about anarchist history, is absolutely rare. This old man is putting on such a good and wholesome performance that it kind of warms my heart as I continue to watch. And even with my bias on the subject matter aside, he is at least the most considerate of those who are preaching whatever it is these characters are preaching. I do need to take off my rose-colored glasses because there are still quite a few things to cover within this video. For example, this troubling scene in a diner with this guy who is seemingly being harassed by a couple of people, but when you listen to what they have to say, it's kind of questionable. 
like this mumbling woman who all of a sudden says, You should, you should, you, you should never traumatize a woman sexually. I should know. I'm a medical doctor. Uh, what the fuck? I, who is not a medical doctor, by the way, is not going to be spending this segment trying to diagnose her, but instead question the creative decision in including this character. Considering that this film came out in 1991 during a time where mental illness was very poorly depicted in cinema, this is where I began to question Richard Linklater if this was a legitimate decision that he made on his part to include this actress. Luckily for us, we actually have his commentary. Let's take a listen. Quit following me. You heard me? Quit following me. Lewis Black plays the paranoid guy. Wait, did you just say Lewis Black? Oh, you Lois Black. Never mind. Carry on. So Lori, she had worked with schizophrenics. She worked at the think at the state school and had some experience. So I wanted her to play the the lady who was had this rant going. That's a bit of an issue which seems to be camouflaged with the veneer of good intentions. It is good to get somebody who is familiar and educated on mental disorders and mental illness. But this is somebody who is either going to school or is currently working with people who are her clients. Meaning you made her perform this as she is observed from her own workplace. That is really disgusting. Because people with mental illnesses and mental disorders are already dehumanized in these institutions already. When the current medical system in the United States doesn't really have a solution for their mental illness. So for her to actually work with these people and now she is performing a bastardization of these people that she works with, I don't know, that's a bit offensive. Okay, for the sake of argument, let's say I'm just making conjecture and everything I said is pointless. Just because she is putting on this performance doesn't mean that Richard Linklater intended for this to be a bastardization. Well, let's hear what else you have to say. All this, this scene exactly happened to me at a little coffee shop right near Columbus Circle in New York. I remember at the new director's new films, people were like, is everybody in Austin crazy? And I was like, actually, the basis for that scene, they use this scene as an example. I said, actually, this entire scene almost verbatim happened to me at a coffee shop about two blocks from here. <laughs> people are crazy everywhere. I'm a medical doctor. I just think some places they're slower to put them in jail or lock them away. I think as long as you're, you can be a total, like, schizo sociopath or whatever, you just can't be a psychopath or violent. That's what gets you locked up, but you can pretty much get away with anything. Homie, why are you like this? You had a really good film coming up and you just had to take a shit all over it. I believe your story, but it doesn't make it okay to make this scene. People in her position need to get some help, like actual professional help, and not be thrown away in jail quicker. I mean, violent or not, people who are dealing with mental illness most of the time are so vulnerable that they are not able to legally represent themselves in court or to handle a police encounter with a stable mind, especially considering that police encounters usually trigger a lot of anxiety in people. To me, this is just kind of sad that you chose to make it the butt of your joke here. You should. You should quit traumatizing women with sexual intercourse. <laughs> I should know. You should quit hey, traumatizing man. women with sexual intercourse. I should know. I'm a medical like, doctor. This woman really was saying all this stuff to me. You should never, and, um... never know. You never know. <laughs> You're an asshole. And maybe you're okay with that. After all, you are from Texas. The same state that has a neo-Nazi shooting up a fucking mall. Your state representative calls the LGBT community groomers while he himself is guilty of grooming his own volunteers. Who are underage, by the way. Your state blocked a woman who needed an abortion so bad that it was actually going to threaten her life if she didn't get this abortion. If I really wanted to go on and on and on about how fucking messed up your fucking state is, then why don't we just fucking go there? Because you're picking on this woman whom you apparently encountered in real life saying this actual shit verbatim. You dipshit. Who knows what she went through? Who knows if she ever got the help that she needed? You son of a bitch, I'm sorry I complimented you earlier with the anarchist dude. Oh my god, man, I really shouldn't have. 
And so far, with some of the interesting things that we've talked about with this movie, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the guy that I spent a lot of time talking about. Lewis is a philosophy professor at University of Texas, now retired. He has this great voice, you know, I just, cool guy. I remember running into him at a swan show, you know. This entire scene is based on a short story by a friend of mine, Jack Meredith, that I read. I sort of adapted it. What's on this wall is like my greatest hits of, uh, I kept files of like disasters and the Leon Cholgosh. It's funny when you open up a can of worms, Leon Cholgosh. I just, Eric Schlosser, the fast food nation author, did a play that I've become familiar with recently called Americans about Leon Cholgosh and McKinley, just performed in London. So it was kind of a kind of an interesting little footnote in American history that actually resonates. There was such a thing as belief put into action in those days. There's a certain sweetness to the scene that he would see a kindred spirit in someone who probably was mindlessly like, oh, you know, trying to steal something from his house. Of course, he's sitting there reading a book, but, you know, a movie is about the idea of whether to act or not act. And a lot of it's purely theoretical. Like, so he's talking about, you know, if there were a hundred like him around today, they could change the world, which, you know, I kind of would believe. But, um, I was there that you would champion or worship kind of people who did act out or people who did take that risk and actually do something in the world because most of us are pretty passive contemplative you know we're always really quick to categorize and judge others we give ourselves a lot of latitude to have various views and you know ambiguities and you know all kinds of conflicting ideas can be housed in ourselves but in other people we want it really simple you know at least simple enough to label, characterize. And then, of course, in a media free market way, that becomes commodified and exploited. I guess I'm just kind of disheartened that you would express empathy and compassion for this older gentleman, but not for this mentally ill girl who is probably really troubled. Yeah, we're always really quick to categorize and judge others. I realize that this is the late 80s, early 90s, and this is something that you yourself experienced on the receiving end of, but I am kind of curious that with the benefit of hindsight, do you harbor these same views that you had back then? Because this kind of comes across as punching downward rather than punching upward. Punching downward towards people who could very much use some compassion and empathy. I've ran into people in Los Angeles while homeless who were also mentally ill and going through a serious crisis, some of whom even got confrontational and violent with me. But even in those dire situations, the last thing I want to do is throw them in jail. Because for one, that could result in them getting murdered, and two, it doesn't solve what they are currently going through. Anyway, that's just one of those scenes that I found to be kind of troubling. But that doesn't make the whole movie shitty. It's just kind of something that bothered me for a really long time and I wanted to vocalize it. Like I said, this movie is an experience. So I won't be talking about all of the scenes, but there are some scenes that are worth mentioning still. This is one scene that I never quite understood myself. It starts off with this guy making small talk to whom I assume is an acquaintance of his. Apparently he's in a band and he has a show coming up and that's really cool, I will admit. If he came up to me and also started saying this shit, I would also sit and listen to him. I'm in this band, well, the one I was in before, but now we've changed our name. Ta-da. <laughs> We're the Ultimate Losers now. That's a great name for a band, The Ultimate Losers. Not gonna lie, I kind of wish I thought of it myself. Anyway, out of nowhere, this person just jumps out of fucking nowhere. Yo, hey, dude. Hey. Man, I am freaking out so severely. Did you hear what happened on the freeway? You didn't see the local news today? Oh, it's beautiful. Man, this old man driving to town from San Antonio, like this old man about 40 or 50 years old, going about 100 miles an hour down the freeway, waving a gun at people, laughing. Like doing fucking chicken squawks at people out the window and showing them his gun and going like, ha 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 Things like that. People were freaked. They didn't know if he was just a lunatic, you know, with like a squirt gun or what. And then check it out. The guy started firing on the freeway randomly through his windows. He shot one bullet up at the roof of his car and it just ricocheted around inside with him for a while. He was like out of his mind. Everybody tried to get off the freeway. Some chick who had a 
bullet lodged in her ponytail called the pigs in San Marcos. And they had six or seven pig cars chasing him into the south side of town. He was still swinging the gun around, man, and laughing. Fucking laughed all the way. Holy shit, dude. No wonder this character made the cover of the fucking movie. Blammo. She then brags about how she got a gynecologist from Hollywood to give her a pap smear that supposedly belongs to Madonna. Which, first of all, is absolutely fucking gross. Secondly, not very sanitary. And third, probably a fucking violation of confidentiality. And she just opens it and takes it out like, yeah, hey, look, it's Madonna's pap smear. Like, that is so... F what the fuck, man? This scene comes across as being edgy for the sake of being edgy. And if that was the goal, then I mean, holy shit, you won the whole ass game. The origin of the pap smear for me was up in Montana. A friend up there, Matt Crowley, I remember him theorizing the future of pornography would be Madonna pap smears. That idea always stayed with me. So here it was about four years later, kind of working that into a scene like, oh, let's, let's actually physically manifest the pap smear. And of course it would be a commodity. So I like the idea of uh, her trying to sell it, you know, trying to get some cash for it. Okay, believe it or not, I can actually relate to that. There's something that I do jokingly, and I've done it since before the legalization of cannabis here in the United States, and that is joke about the evilness of the marijuana pill. Those of you who are my close friends who are watching this video know exactly what I'm talking about. I have a deep fascination with anti-drug propaganda because it's absolutely ridiculous, and so it makes it worth parodying. So the marijuana pill would be a joke that would get parents to fearmonger about cannabis and worry about their kids. It would be like another made up scapegoat, making fun of the fact that it's a scapegoat. But believe it or not, in the day and age where cannabis is currently being sold in dispensaries, people do sell marijuana pills, like little cannabis capsules. So yeah, it kind of goes full circle there. Which is why I can kind of relate to what Richard Linklater is saying. There's another element in this film that I want to talk about, and that is the pedestrian factor. A lot of these people seem to be not so financially well off, probably live in the projects or something like that. And with a few exceptions, not a whole lot of people are driving cars in this movie. I know this is such a minute detail, but the reason why I like it so much is because I like the fact that you could just kind of walk around and encounter people. Whereas when you're inside of a car, you're kind of surrounded by this bubble that kind of makes you an asocial creature existing in a very social world. Which makes this movie kind of like one of my favorites in a way because this is a movie not just of people meeting each other, but it's of complete chance encounters. And I don't know, I just kind of like that. I just thought that was pretty neat. There's also this one guy who's like a complete video head and his home is just like full of TVs, playing different movies, recording all kinds of shit. It's so fucking baffling. This dude is absolutely fucking weird and I like him because of that. There's a lot more I could say on this movie, but I would rather that if you so choose to go Experience it for yourself. I can't really recommend this movie, even if you do keep up with all of the social interactions that goes on throughout this film, it's still kind of a fucking snore fest. But I will say this, when it's good, it is really good. And when it's bad, I mean, it really, really sunk to the bottom of the fucking Mariana Trench. If you are gonna watch this movie, Maybe just like watch it once and maybe just never touch it again. And I think that's all I really have to say. I mean, yeah, that's it. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Jesus, it's, well it's like one of those government programs. Just come and fucking get anything you want. We're gonna give away all the fucking automatic weapons. All the side loaders, clip loaders, shooting backs. Saturday night special, Colt 45, shotguns, anything you want, chains, knives, straight razors, bottles, brick bats, baseball bats, and big kind of slanted jacket kind of things.
I want to see a goddamn big motherfucking shoot him up, kill him, bang, stab him, crush, flies, kill, motherfucking ball and all. Catapults, throwing rocks and shit and blowing up undercover shit, yeah. So I want to see people putting secret things in, in fucking cars and fucking explode and see the people explode in them. I want to see knife cutting, slash cutting, chopping, blowing up. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's right. A free fucking weapons giveaway program. I see it. I'm gonna solve all these goddamn problems.